Welcome everybody to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. And Hank, thank you for putting some time aside for this Values Jam. And to start with, could you please introduce yourself, tell everybody about the great work that you do and also how people might find you. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, well, I'm uh, Hank Kuhn. Uh, I live and work from uh, a small office in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, I would call myself, if I have to find a label, a uh, societal uh, innovator. And that means that I try to support, sometimes initiate, often support projects uh, which aim at uh, an innovation in the way society looks at or addresses major problems. Uh, and those problems could range uh, from how do we help organizations have a more future-oriented uh, way of working uh, to uh, ideas like how can we renew the quality of democracy in the next decade and the next uh, 20 years, uh, organizing conversations with people of uh, uh, different ages about the type of world that they'd like to live in uh, at mid-century, uh, coming up faster than uh, we ever thought, and uh, doing uh, workshop-style sessions uh, under the name of Oracy Labs, trying to promote the idea that in the present-day world, uh, the quality of being able to speak well and listen powerfully is as important as literacy. And there are very many kinds of literacy which we know about, but I, uh, with a number of colleagues, are trying to uh, enhance our understanding of the different types of oracy needed. I have a website, I have a LinkedIn page, I'm active on WhatsApp and I'm active on uh, uh, email. Uh, so uh, I think I'll post a little later on in this call uh, links to the WhatsApp, uh, to the uh, LinkedIn and to uh, the website. Great. Thanks very much, Hank. And there's a couple of things I just wanted to uh, touch on before we get into the values jam. I love uh, the label that you chose, societal innovator, but I've got a question around that because I remember when I was in uh, a role in business and we were looking to push innovation, we made a conscious choice not to put too much pressure on everybody that their innovation should definitely succeed. Because if that was the case, we felt that it was actually reducing the innovation that people are willing to try. So how do you deal with, with that? You know, achieving innovation, but lowering the bar enough so that people feel confident and comfortable to try new things? Well, many people uh, have an obsession with the new, uh, as opposed to something that can be uh, changed, renewed, rethought, reframed in ways that are really relevant to their lives and work. So I found that the best way to help people get over the uh, the barrier of, on the one hand, uh, it's good because it's new and we'll throw everything old out the out the window. And uh, why do I have to change? Things are working fine just the way they are. Is I try to help people imagine a positive future, uh, a future that they want to work towards and live in. Uh, and it can be done on a very simple two or three year uh, time horizon, on a 10 year time horizon. And there are groups who really want to think about what the world may be like uh, in 50 or 70 or 80 years. But whatever time horizon people choose, they're invited to say, 
what makes it attractive to them, why they would like to work in that future or have their children or grandchildren live in that future. And by making it as personal as possible, uh, you uh, entice, perhaps say, uh, seduce people to uh, look to their own values, uh, look to the world around them through the lens of how can I make something better and more fit for use that fits their own values. And that's my experience uh, so far. It's not perfect, but it works better than many other things we've tried. <laughs> well, that's that's quite uncanny, actually, because there's a, a workshop that I use with corporate clients called Velocity, and it's kind of similar in that we ask people to project themselves forward in time and then imagine the future fantastic state that has been created and then we work back from that rather than start at today and try and work forward so that's, that's an interesting parallel so let's um let's open the values cham card deck i'm gonna tip some cards out and uh, how many piles would you like me to make in front of me hank uh, how about three piles? Three piles. Okay, they're different sizes. And I have a left pile, a right pile, and a middle pile. So which would you like? Uh, I'd uh, advise you to take something from the uh, right pile at the moment. Okay. And there are 11 cards. So a number between 1 and 11. Uh, seven. Seven. <laughs> Okay, so Hank, we're going to play with harmony. I like it already. Good. And the first question is, what does harmony mean? And what does it look, feel and sound like? Well, I would uh, say that there's at least two uh, ways to think of harmony. Uh, there's the harmony when uh, people in a neighborhood or an organization or a region or a country feel that they are all trying to work towards the same goals, that they have very similar values. And although they may use different language, different kind of language to express what it is that they think is important, they can always find enough common ground, enough common wealth in order to move their, well, family or neighborhoods uh, or region or country in the ways that they believe is important. The other thing about harmony I'd like to talk about is uh, in a sense of music and many different uh, instruments making beautiful music together or trying to uh, uh, relate it to my earlier uh, explanation, many different voices, voices in a neighborhood or a community or a nation, many different voices making beautiful music together. Uh, in the past, people talked about the uh, music of the spheres and a celestial harmony. And I think the word harmony can resonate from the individual, through the family, through the community, and up into the way we understand or follow the laws of nature. Hmm. And the, the, there's a couple of things that you're making me think, uh, there, Hank, because, uh, and this card is very special because um, Lisa Bertels was the co-founder of this game, Values Jam. And harmony is really core to her and her beliefs. So that's why it's really important. I'm so pleased that you've chosen the card. And what she talks about in terms of harmony is the focus on difference. And you talked about different instruments and different voices. And so she really emphasizes how rather than everybody playing the same tune, it, that's not required necessarily to have harmony. And in fact, it can be beneficial when you have so many different voices, but when they come together, 
it creates this beautiful harmony. So we're absolutely aligned on that one. And then the other thing that I just wanted to comment on you, I love the term that you used, common wealth. And it just made me think of the commonwealth uh, with the words put together. And I, it made me wonder whether that was the origination of that name, because that's what it should be about. Although I think it's quite a far away from, from that in reality, right? Yeah, that's, that's a very good thought there. I actually don't know if that is the origin of the name of Commonwealth, as we know in terms of the British Commonwealth. But it certainly has to do with pooling uh, your gifts, pooling your talents, pooling your strengths, and perhaps your financial resources in order to strive to create that type of harmony that I think you and I both believe is very important. Mm. Now, I've got, I've got a question forming for you, and I think this draws on your area of work and experience, because I, I had a picture in my mind, and we'll move on to the metaphor part of the question shortly, but let, let's just deal with this if we could. Um, so I've got a picture in my mind of an orchestra, and the sound is beautiful, the harmony is amazing. And I want to draw a parallel with the way the world works. And for me, the question is, in the world, who is the conductor? Yeah, that's, that's a somewhat metaphysical uh, question, if I could use that term. Uh, the conductor in the world, I would say, and I'm just thinking out loud uh, sure. at the moment, is the uh, combined intelligences of humans, uh, animals, uh, plants, and perhaps even what we might term the inanimate. Uh, uh, structures of the world. Uh, there's a lot said uh, and written recently about how forests think. And if you consider uh, not only the number of animals, but the number of trees and plants in the world, all of them working in the ways that are resonant with their own nature. And if you want to try to give a, uh, a, a spirit to rivers or mountains, uh, perhaps the atmosphere, uh, thinking back to generations of animate uh, people and objects that have lived before us and thinking ahead to those that we hope will live after us. I think from that diversity of spirit, diversity of intelligence, diversity of uh, uh, intention, a director of the world uh, emerges. And it could be uh, different at different times, uh, but at the moment, I think humans have become much more aware that we share this planet uh, with many other living things. And that uh, if we don't reflect on the ways of sharing of ourselves and of others, we might be heading to an uncomfortable situation in the near future. Yeah, and I, I think that that thought uh, that you finished with there is really what made me consider the, the metaphor with the orchestra, because I was wondering about the world and thinking, well, isn't it a bit like an orchestra at the moment with no conductor, where perhaps the oboe section is trying to make itself bigger and louder and more heard compared to the rest of the players in the orchestra, because... That's the way the world works. 
rather than a communal spirit, totally communal spirit, totally aligned objectives, and placing trust in the conductor in order to achieve everybody's goal. So I know this is a, a, maybe it's too philosophical, but it just it just struck me that uh, there's such a big difference between a high performing orchestra and the way the world works right now. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, one thing I would uh, question is uh, if we put a value judgment on it, is it good? Is it bad? Or does it just simply uh, need to happen so that the oboes discover where their place could be, where the the strings uh, are either too loud or too soft, and by uh, attempting different ways of relating in the orchestra, relating in the world, uh, the right harmony emerges. Yeah, great thought, great thought. So in that first question, the, the second half of it what was, what uh, does harmony look, feel, and sound like? So what images come to mind when you think of harmony? What feelings come to mind and maybe easier what sounds come to mind well uh i'll start with with images um i really like uh, the image of the starry sky at night uh it's something that's become somewhat difficult to see in large cities. But if you have the opportunity to be in a place where there's not very much ambient light and you look up into the sky and you see the enormous number of lights, some stronger, some less strong, and then think that they are not necessarily near to one another as they appear to us as being near and you let your thoughts go in that kind of those kinds of directions then you get both an image and if you are fortunate a feeling of your place within the vastness of the universe and that's to me something that uh, I might call uh, myself being in harmony with my environment. Uh, that, that's an image I like. As far as the sounds, uh, I well, I'm a music lover, and I like everything between uh, uh, what we used to call pop music and singer songwriters to jazz and improvisation to uh, uh, symphonies of the great composers of the past. And you know what harmony is like when you hear a piece for the first time or for the thousandth time and it brings you to that place that I was describing looking into the vastness of the stars so that can be uh, enhanced by images it can be enhanced by nature and it can be enhanced by music Thank you for painting those beautiful pictures, and you've you've reminded me of some very fond memories that I'm I'm going to share now. Um, so the first one, uh, we went on a holiday to southern Spain, uh, around about I don't know if you're familiar with the geography of southern Spain, about one hour west of um, Malaga, and yeah, yeah. around about twenty minutes north of the coast. Um, near to a small town called Frigiliana, which is a white village. But we didn't stay there. We were 20 minutes away in a previously abandoned village. So like you were mentioning, very low levels of ambient light. And there was a terrace at the back of the property where we were staying. And I just, your story has just reminded me of us staring up at the 
stars and just think and we said how how can there be this many you know it was just like because we're not used to seeing so many stars because we we live in um more well-lit environments and the other thing that you mentioned about harmony with nature um this is another parallel hank because i i really enjoy the feeling when i'm in nature of how small i am compared to how big nature is and it doesn't so two specific memories one was in south africa when i remember looking out onto um a just massive landscape and thinking it's so big uh, and being struck by that but even locally if i go for a walk in uh, we've got some ancient woodland near here um and i from time to time, I think if that tree fell on me, <laughs> that would be it finished. <laughs> and it, it it just feels so good to remind yourself how small and inconsequential uh, we are. So thank you for that. Um, and so then, and sound. Oh yes, and sound. Are you familiar with Gregorian chant music? Uh, you're somewhat familiar. Yeah. Okay. So I was visiting a friend in the southwest of France, and we visited. Um, just on chance, an abbey. And in the abbey, there was uh, an elderly man walking around and he started to sing Gregorian chant music. And um, my friend Francois asked him, you know, what, what was happening. And this guy just demonstrated how the abbey had been constructed to really make the most of the sound. So he stood in the center of um, the, the kind of small room or compartment of the abbey and then he stood with his back against the wall and he sang a note and then stopped but the note just carried on and on and he explained it was a combination of the material used in the construction and also the architectural design to enhance the sound and of course the harmony so um thank you for for bringing those up Let's um let's deal with another question then, and let's let's go to the opposite side of the beautiful harmony that we've been talking about. Where have you noticed a lack of harmony? Uh, uh, in the news, uh, in uh, social media and uh, news media. Uh, of course, we understand that in order to sell newspapers or to get subscribers or to get followers or to get likes, uh, media tend to uh, increase our awareness of disagreement, of conflict, of trouble in the world. Uh it's something I think we always need to bear in mind when we are trying to get informed through uh, through uh, media, either uh, online or uh, or physically in the world. Uh, it's their job to get our attention, and unfortunately, our attention is more easily gotten by stories of conflict, stress, and strife than by stories of how life goes on in a better way for people, better today than in the past. Uh, so that's a, a <clears throat> that's for me a uh, an important uh, source of uh, disharmony. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we can see it in the, the headlines in the Dutch newspapers uh, today. Uh, one major story is how the European Union is not ready to uh, admit nine new members. Another story is about how the House of Representatives in the United States uh, throughout the Speaker of the House, there are stories about uh, tax fraud and other irregularities in the recent history of the Netherlands, stories about who's to blame, stories about who did something wrong. But aren't there any stories which 
help us think of the things that are good in the world, that are being achieved, that are so important, we almost don't know they're going on. So that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, it's a good answer, Hank. And I'm thinking again, uh, I'm thinking about when I worked in the corporate world and what you do in when you're in a leadership role in the corporate world is actually make the most of the successes and the achievements. And in my experience anyway, you seek to minimize or deal with or eliminate the negativity that's in the organization for the benefit of the organization. So why is it so different for the world? And um, Because I, I agree with you 100% about the media and the media is such a powerful vehicle and it's very damaging as a result. Yeah. Well, I like to... Uh emphasize the importance of uh, a positive frame of mind. Yeah. Uh, when I speak with people about the type of work I do, uh, there's a methodology I helped uh, develop with a number of colleagues called positive cartography, uh, mapping the positive futures that uh, we would like to get to. And then uh, as indeed in your exercise uh, velocity, working back from the positive future we'd like to work to, to try to discover what needs to be done to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, everyone I talk with thinks that's wonderful. Why don't they do it in their normal lives? I think they are caught up in a in a kind of self perpetuating uh self perpetuating uh, meme of uh i'm just one person uh they are in charge uh i might not be able to affect the world with my uh own personal endeavors so instead of trying to break out of the tsunami of negativity, which is often overwhelming us, they say, uh, well, let me close myself off to it yeah. and uh, uh, try in my own small way to make do. But make do, making do is not making better. Yeah. And I think that... Um... Maybe you meant this, um, but just to add it in case you, you didn't mean to include it, I think that there is a tendency for us to think that we have to follow what's happening around us, just to respond and to react to situations. But there is another way, which is to decide the way you want to be and then be like that rather than bother yourself with what is happening around you. Um, so that's the first thing. And then you've reminded me, I can't remember the person who said this. I think it might have been Anita Roddick, who uh, used to be the head of Body Shop. Yeah. And I think her quote was something like, if you think you're too small to have an impact, look at a mosquito. <laughs> that's that's a nice anecdote it makes me think immediately of and i can't remember who said it uh if you think you are too big that's right and if you think you are too small you are you are very much what you think you are and the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves yeah. are very important for uh, chaining or unchaining our uh, capacity to influence the world yeah and I, so we will move on to a, another question shortly but there's just one thing that actually i should have mentioned this earlier but it's just come back into my mind now and it goes back to when you were picturing the nighttime sky. Uh, are you familiar with the work of David Bohm? Yes, I am somewhat familiar. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I 
I admire the guy's work. I really don't understand a lot of what he talks about. Um, but uh, the reason I mention this is because as a layperson, um, he uses the nighttime sky to explain one of his points of view. And it is around um, how scientists consider that their role is to break everything down into its very smallest component parts. Um, but David Bohm realized that that is futile because that's not the way things work. Things work as a whole. And he explains this with the nighttime sky because he says, you know, when you look up and you see the stars and you compare the size of the stars and everything else, what you need to realize as well is that the only reason you can see them is because of the black sky behind them and everything is the whole. And I think that that is a, just a beautiful image and a really clever way to describe uh, his point of view. So um, just wanted to share that before we moved on to the next question. Very, very nice thought. Uh, in fact, the work David Bohm did on uh, dialogue has been very influential in my own way of thinking about how we, ah, yes, how we talk with each other, how we listen to each other. Uh, and that's his work has been taken a long way by some of the people at the um, MIT uh, school and uh, ideas about that kind of dialogue, a kind of uh, conversation with uh, a center and no borders uh, has been very important in my work. Oh, well, so uh, every, not every month, but m kind of every month, there is a Values Jam deep dive conversation taking a specific topic, and we use the Bohm Dialogue um, approach yeah. there. Yeah. It, it's it's such a liberating approach, I think. Um, sometimes people find it quite challenging because it's so different to a normal conversation, but the the results are often really powerful. Um, so in, that's another parallel. Okay, so let's move let's move on uh, to another question. So in the values jam um, card game, Hank, we we have the opportunity for you to create your own question. So could you ask your own question to us about harmony? beginning with who, what, where, when, why, or how? How, how, how can we help people experience harmony in lives when they tell themselves that everything is out of balance? Let's see if can I make that uh easier how can we help people understand or be aware of the harmony in their own lives hmm. and do you have some initial thoughts or would you like me to have a go um well i've got initial thoughts about everything these days <laughs> but no please please uh, feed the conversation with an idea or two okay so I'm thinking that to draw people's attention and awareness to the harmony that exists in their lives might be a starting point, because sometimes we overlook or don't see things because we take them for granted. Um, so, for instance, um, I'm not sure this is in line, but it, it, it's in my mind, so I'll share it. During the pandemic, people had an increased focus on well-being and an increased understanding of the importance of well-being. And I think many people who were fortunate enough to have good health actually realised that and appreciated it more and placed more value on it because of the situation. So it strikes me that one thing that could be done is to direct people um, or help them to focus more on and be more aware of the harmony that does exist in their lives. And then perhaps ask them to consider how they might um, 
move that because they're obviously able to enjoy it and achieve it in one part of their life how what would need to happen for that to be realized in different parts of their lives so there's a starting point yeah that's that's a very good starting point uh if i could develop that uh, somewhat uh it's often easy to remember the unfortunate things and difficult to remember the things that went well. And I think if people could be uh, could be guided, that's the right word, allowed, give themselves permission, would be allowed to think of things that they were able to do that they were very satisfied about and try to get an embodied uh, an embodied feeling of why they were satisfied when doing any particular thing uh, something small in their lives something uh <sighs> something contributing to the harmony in the family or a or a neighborhood uh, through their job through breaking an old habit uh, making a new habit could be small could be larger but how did they feel when they were able to do that and give them more experiences of their own capacity for feeling that they were in harmony with their environment, whether they were in a state of flow. I was going to mention uh, flow, uh, an idea of uh, several decades ago, which I think is very important, uh, being in the zone. Uh, uh, you can give it any number of uh, of uh, of labels, but when you are there, you're not thinking, you are just being. And afterwards, you can recognize that you were in harmony with uh with your environment and i think giving people more experience or i'll, I'll say that uh, clearer helping people relive their own experiences of it could help them uh to want that or work more towards that in their, their present lives yeah and I, I, adding to that, perhaps some form of structured approach that people might be able to use. So um, I know some people that work in the area of gratitude, which I'm reminded of by uh, this part of our conversation. And I think it might be part of Judaism, uh, where at the end of the day, you're encouraged to consider three things that you're grateful for at the end of the day, every day. Um, and that's, a, I think, a beautiful way to just reinforce to yourself um, the harmony, because gratitude and harmony, I think, are, are very closely related. Uh, and if, if that structure is in place, it really helps to embed and make it more tangible. Whereas if you're just hoping that it might happen sometime, then perhaps you get too busy and then it doesn't happen. And by definition, you're in a a less strong place uh, so maybe something around putting structure in place for people in some way that suits them yeah i i like that idea when you first uh, mentioned structure i thought oh no not a uh, uh, another seven steps towards uh but I, I'm very happy that you you brought it up and also its uh, spiritual origins uh i think something like that a kind of easy practice of thinking about three things that you're grateful for in a day but also sharing it with other people uh could work very well uh without the need to get into deep conversations about that with others but at least uh asking or telling about those things that you liked about 
the day, those things that enriched you during the day or those things you were grateful for during the day uh, could help uh, build the re resonance within yourself, but when you are resonating with others and uh, perhaps come, uh, uh, come up with some surprising ideas and thoughts. Yeah. And it, it, so this this is taking me back to the bit when we were talking about the media. And it's also reminding me of a guy that um, I was lucky enough to work with uh, quite some number of years ago now at the beginning of the 2000s. And his focus, uh, a lot of his focus was around the power of language. And the example that you've reminded me of, he, he told this story, so this is how it goes. Imagine a guy in an office who has a desk close to the elevator, and it is his desk is on the route for the rest of his colleagues on the way to their desks. And so many people say to him, good morning, Hank, how are you? And he, in response, says, I'm not bad. And repeats not <laughs> bad hundreds of times during the day, which, and this guy is called Marcus Child, a really fantastic guy. Um, and so this guy is repeating not and bad to his inner dialogue all the way through the day. And Marcus um, suggested that, what would the impact be if instead of that response of not bad at the beginning of the day, Hank said, I'm excellent, thank you, how are you? And repeated similar language to this, in which case he's kind of a lot more positive and spreading that positivity to other people. Uh, and so it just struck me that that bit that we were talking about, about um, vocalising in a positive way and also um, the the parallel with the media and how the media could have so much more of a positive impact if it consciously chose to take that perspective rather than one that it does, it might create much more harmony. Yeah, that, that's a very nice story. Uh, uh, it reminded me immediately of an Aikido uh, exercise. Uh, you can stand and two people will and uh, let's let's uh, let's frame it differently if you say i'm trying to be anchored to the floor people can lift you up but if you say i am they can't yeah if you say uh i'm trying to keep my arm straight one or two people can easily yeah. bend it but if you say my arm is straight yeah they have difficulty doing that the the, the stories you tell yourselves the words you use are very very important to how you relate to the world how you relate to the harmony in yourself yeah, and Marcus, so that that last exercise that you've just described, Marcus uses that, um, ah. and but with a slight variation. Uh, so what the the way that we uh, practiced that was that he would ask, and this is great fun when you've got a, a big group. I, I've I've led uh, this myself, and it's it really good fun. So you can ask for the strongest person in the room. That's the so you know the the six foot plus guy who's really muscular and you ask them to come to the front of the room and then put their arm out uh, and then to imagine something that they feel strongly positive about, whether it be a partner or a child or peace, it could be a concept like this. And then they put their arm out and they say the thing that is so positively strong for them. And you demonstrate how you're unable to press their arm down. Mm. Then you ask them to consider something that really angers them, annoys them, makes them feel dreadful. So it might be war, for instance, in, in that example that I've just given. 
And then, and I, I really still don't understand uh, the science of how this works fully, but you are every single time you're able to push, push this person's hand down. And I, I think in simple terms, what Marcus says is that, you know, your thoughts become your physical being. And if you're thinking about something that distresses you and makes you weak, then it does in physical reality as well. Yeah, very, very interesting uh, uh, story. I, I'd certainly like to try that uh, myself. More yeah, have a, have a go. And, and holding your arm straight or your back straight or being uh, flexible enough to move with what's happening in the world as opposed to stand stiff and be broken by winds of change yeah and then there's um it i can't remember who this was they were talking about uh leadership and they were saying that the best leaders are like a tree so their roots are absolutely firm and anchored in the ground through their values uh, but above the ground, the tree can sway with the storm or the wind uh, rather than feel that it has to be rigid because that's not the way that it will survive. Um, OK, so let's uh, finish with a big question. And it is well, and it's not finished, really, because I've got one smaller question afterwards. But uh, let's finish with how could more harmony improve the world well uh in line with the way i was trying to describe uh, uh harmony in the early part of this conversation i think that uh if there were more harmony amongst people, harmony between people and the natural environment, things would happen that have to happen. Things would emerge which are in line with what does need to happen in terms of the evolution of our species, of the evolution of other living things in the world, and the evolution of the planet. Uh, more harmony is less blockage. And uh, I'm probably going to mix a metaphor here, but water always finds the easiest way. Uh, I think harmony would allow water to find uh, the most relevant ways rather than simply the easiest way. It would allow things that are flowing, the metaphor of flowing water, to uh, flow in the ways which are emerging as next steps in uh, our understanding of our place in the universe. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm um, I'm a bit disappointed with myself with my answer to this question because I'm by nature optimistic, but I'm finding this question is is causing me to think quite pessimistically actually because it's making me think that harmony absolutely could improve the world, but I'm wondering how possible that is when. There are so many people that haven't got the basics to lead a life with dignity. And in a situation like that, how could it be possible for there to be harmony? That's the first thing. And then secondly, I, I keep going back to the orchestra that we were talking about, where you've got the different sections at the moment just jostling um, to to try and be the best part of the orchestra. We don't have uh, an orchestra. And, it, and maybe it's because we don't have the, the score written that we all want to be able to play. So I think my answer to this is that harmony could improve the world enormously if we could have a score that we all played to. 
yeah, that's uh, well put. Uh, and the score we all play to could be uh, framed as what makes a good life. Yes. And in uh, in the Western world, in a number of more developed economies, uh, people don't think enough about what makes a good life. Uh, they accept the tsunami of uh, consumerism thrown at them, the tsunami of uh, negativity that there are zero-sum games. If I want to get ahead, uh, you've yeah. got to fall behind. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, story to try to develop. Uh, what makes a good life? And of course, I, I'm limiting myself to uh, the people with uh, the good fortune to have been born into a rather, uh, rather good uh, economies. But what makes that economy good? And there are many ways to answer that question. And I do believe that we're moving into a time frame where people will revisit that story and perhaps reframe it, uh, not having the best Tesla on the black or not having the, uh, the, the children going to the most prestigious universities and not having a new uh, 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 sofa every two years, but to having enough yeah. to experience their own definition of what's good. Uh, the negative ideas or, let's say, uh, unanswered questions that you uh, brought up about uh, many people in the world have to be addressed, I think, in harmony with the entire world, with the richer countries and the poorer countries, with the countries with more older people and the countries with more younger people trying to achieve what uh, uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, called common agendas and intergenerational solidarity. Uh, so that's, I think, part of my hopeful answer to your to your comments. Yeah, and that's I think that's a, a brilliant way to bring this a values jam to a close uh, on that optimistic note, uh, pragmatically optimistic note, actually. Uh, so that there is a final question, and that is this, Hank. What are you encouraged to do differently about harmony as a result of our conversation? talk with my uh, wife and my friends about the three things I'm grateful for each day. I thought that was a, a wonderful uh, uh, contribution to some simple ways of understanding where you are, where I am in the world of the moment. Thank you. And mine, <laughs> I'm going to go with that as well. So I do it from time to time, but I must confess I haven't actually done this for quite some time. So today uh, I will do that at the end of the day and ask myself what I've been grateful for that's happened today. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'll just send you the details of Marcus Child, because it sounds like uh, some of the things that you've done are quite similar or related to the work that he does so if you're interested to, to know a bit more about him, then you can do that. So that brings the values jam to a close. And I remember at the beginning, you said um, you talked about speaking well and listening powerfully. And I just feel that this conversation that we've had for the past 55 minutes has represented that fully, actually. So thank you so much.
Yeah, and I appreciate the exchange of ideas and uh, the way we've been able to work together to make this hour uh, important also for ourselves. Yeah, thanks, Hank. <laughs>